Right. Okay, well, you say there's no solution to the waste, but there is a solution to the waste, and the solution to the waste is to just leave it exactly where it is and to have somebody look at it for, for a million years, you know. So, so they just have to have all these zombies who are there at the moment, sitting there doing nothing, who are going to just have to sit there, and their children are going to sit there, and their children's children and so on, looking at the waste and making sure that it doesn't leak out of the tanks. And if it starts to look like it's going to leak out of the tanks, they build another tank around that tank, and then they build another tank around the tank that they built around that tank, and so on, you know, to infinity. And that is a solution to the waste, because then the waste will just stay where it is now, and it won't get any worse. And if they make more waste, they'll have to put it inside that tank and leave it there. And as far as contaminated land is concerned, and places like Sellerville and all that, they'll just have to put a fence around it and say, this is contaminated land, do not enter. And so that's the best we can do. I mean, it doesn't help to put it down the hole in the ground. I mean, you may as well put it somewhere where you can keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't escape. So that's the solution. And why not put a hole in the ground? Ah, well, because then if something goes wrong, you can't do anything about it. That's the point. And what could be, could go wrong there? Well, God, well, loads of things could go wrong. I mean, the main thing that would go wrong is that it go, it's, it's a hole in, in the ground is not a secure depository, you know? I mean, you put it into a hole in the ground, and then there's a crack in the hole in the ground, or maybe there's a, an earthquake, or, or maybe there's a fault that you didn't know about, or maybe there's some water movement that, that changes over a period of time. And we're talking geological time scale, so, you know, just about everywhere where they've suggested putting it in a hole in the ground has had a geological um, fault occurring, you know, uh, uh, in, in the last thousand years, never mind about, you know, the next million years or whatever it is it has for the half-life of these uraniums and plutoniums. So you can't, you can't actually guarantee that if you put it in a hole in the ground, something won't go wrong. And you can't pull it out of the hole in the ground, that's the point. I mean, the, the, the Forschmark idea is not one in which they put it down in the hole in the ground and then they can take it out if something goes wrong. They can't. They just pop it down and pop the next one down and pop the next one down and so on and send it all down there and then they seal it all up. But if something goes wrong, then they can't do anything. Whereas if it's where it is at the moment, at Sellafield or wherever it is, above ground or in some kind of big hangar or big kind of area where they kind of look at it, then they can look at it. And if something goes wrong, they've got all their detectors and their Geiger counters and whatnot, then they can just repackage it and put something around it. But they have to sit there? Yeah, they have to sit there forever, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Well, it serves them right, isn't it? Shouldn't have made it in the first place. And I've no doubt they'll pay them a lot of money for sitting there. <laughs> so, yeah, they can sit there. And, and, I mean, maybe they should have special uniforms, like, you know, guard of the nuclear waste, and they could have, like, special kind of green uniforms with special badges, like Superman or something, you know? that make them feel good. <laughs> I've always thought it quite good to have special uniforms. In all the science fiction stories, they did special uniforms, you know. So you could say, what's your daddy do? Oh, he's a god of the nuclear waste. Oh, no. <laughs> what a useful job, George. Yes, it is, isn't it? Today, I'd like to welcome to the show Dr. Leslie Cannett. Dr. Cannett is a geologist, and he's also on the Fairwinds Board of Directors. Dr. Cannett, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And of course, Arnie, welcome to the show. Yeah, hi Kevin, hi Les. Hi Arnie. So, we've had a lot of reader questions about earthquakes. What are the differences between earthquakes on the west coast, which we all know about, and earthquakes on the east coast, which are less frequent? How does that all fit into the uh, nuclear power plant paradigm? So, earthquakes are a result of earth movement. There are stresses in earth crust that when it, they exceed the rock's strength, then the rock breaks and we get an earthquake. And there are a number of scales that we use to measure. One is the magnitude of the earthquake, and the other is the effects of an earthquake. Now, earthquakes occur all over the planet, yet seem to be most common along plate boundaries. So the west coast of the United States is a plate boundary, and there are numerous earthquakes that occur on the west coast. Yet the eastern seaboard of the U.S., used to be a plate boundary, and there are some seismic zones there that are quite active. What we find that the intensity of the earthquake, that is what one feels, the amount of ground motion, depends on a number of factors, and one is the rock type. So when earthquakes occur on the east coast, because of the rock type, it's felt for quite great distances, probably 10 times farther 
than a similar size earthquake on the West Coast. As uh, Arnie well knows, of the 104 nuclear power plants in the U.S., most of them, I think all but eight of them, are con what we consider on the East Coast or the eastern seaboard of the United States, and only eight of them are on the West Coast. It's important to distinguish the magnitude of an event versus what one feels. So the magnitude of an earthquake is determined by seismographic observations. That means the technology that we have in the ground measure how much energy is released by an earthquake. But what one feels, the reactions, the surface expression of these earthquakes are what we call the intensity. By analogy, you can think of the power of a radio station being a magnitude and the strength of the received signal being the intensity. So depending on where you are in atmospheric conditions, you'll have different signal strength from a radio. With regard to the Earth, there's one magnitude for every earthquake, but there are a variety of intensities based upon distance and rock type and depth of focus. The difference between a magnitude 6 and a magnitude 7 means that there are 31 times more energy released in a 7 than a 6. Often people think that there's a difference of 10 times between a 6 and a 7, but the amount of energy released goes up by a factor of 31. So that 5.8 versus the 6.0 in Virginia makes a big deal difference. That's about uh, roughly, it's a logarithmic scale, but roughly it's about six times more energy released in a 6.0 versus a 5.8. Remember, for every unit, every increment between 5 or 6 or 6 or 7 or 7 or 8, the amount of energy released goes up 31 times, and it takes energy to do work, and the work that's being done is we're moving rock. We're moving large pieces of real estate. Hopefully we're not moving large nuclear power plants. People are very aware of earthquakes on the West Coast and the potential problems of putting a nuclear power plant on a seismically active area. And really when we think about it, we think about nuclear power plants on the West Coast. But who's looking at uh, seismicity with nuclear power plants on the East Coast? There's a group called the Central Eastern U.S. Seismic Source Characterization. It's a group that's put out a really significant, well-thought-out publication back in December of 2011. And the idea there was to look at the relationship of the our new understanding of the seismicity in the United States and the presence of nuclear facilities. So I would think that the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the U.S. Geological Survey are aware of these issues and indeed What's happened is, as a result of this study, is we found that the likelihood of some problem has gone up many times, several fold. Indeed, the, I think they report that the uh, estimated risk of a problem in a nuclear power plant on the East Coast has tripled based upon our new understanding of seismicity along the East Coast. So, Les, as an engineer, what, what I want to know is, What's the worst earthquake I have to design against? And you know, let's take a look at the one in Virginia. That was designed for a six, and uh, the the quake that actually hit was a was a five point eight. So, to my way of thinking, that was close, but it survived. But when you build a nuclear power plant, you don't want to build for the earthquake that is going to happen because. Uh, you've got the low probability, high consequence events like the, the tsunami at, uh, at Fukushima you have to worry about. So when, when engineers are told by geologists that a six is, is the worst you can expect in Virginia and all at once a 5.8 actually happens, does that make you question whether or not you could actually have an earthquake more than a six? There are several issues you raised there. One is, again, just because it is a certain magnitude doesn't mean that that's what one is going to feel. The difference between how big an earthquake is and the intensity depends on a lot of issues. So if the magnitude 6 event was closer to the power plant or the rock type or it was transmitted through the rocks in a different way, then a magnitude 6 could do a lot of damage where another time magnitude 6, a little farther away, a little deeper in, on a different fault, even on a different fault the same distance away, might do no damage. So it's more than just looking at the size of the seismic event. 
It has to do with the location and the long-term history. What we've done in this recent work on reviewing the seismic risk on the East Coast is we had chosen a time period for which we're going to look at the seismic events. The Virginia quake of August of 2011, the 5.8 quake, which is probably the second largest in this region, wasn't included in the data set. So if it was included, I would think that the risks of accidents or damage to facilities on the East Coast would have been greater. So I think, Arnie, an answer to your question is all of us are short-sighted and all of us have deadlines. So how far back in time do we want to look as well as at what point do we say we have enough data to make our choices? And it's risk assessment. Now, I can remember pictures of the spent fuel casks at, um, at North Anna, which was the power plant nearest to the earthquake. And these casks weigh more than 100 tons. And um, you could see where the cask had been on the pad, the, the, the concrete pad, and you could see where the cask had, uh, had moved. And the, these 100-ton these casks were displaced by, by four or five inches. Now, the press reported that as the cask moved. But, but for the physicists out there listening, really, you know, it's like sliding a, a tablecloth out from underneath a, 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 a plate on your table. But the, the cask didn't move at all. The ground moved six <laughs> inches sideways. Well, yeah, that's the way, that's the basis behind the seismometers that we use is that we fix the, we no longer use a pendulum, but if we had a pendulum fixed on, a, on an apparatus and the ground moved, the pendulum would remain motionless and the ground beneath it would move. So, sure, what you said is a good way to think about it. The acceleration of the ground is what we measure when we think about earthquakes, is how fast is the ground moving relative to a stable object and having massive dry cask would certainly want to stay in place as the ground shifts beneath it. When, when you build a nuclear power plant, uh, you have to worry about how fast the ground moves, but then, then you have to move that wave up in the building. The higher up in the building you are, the more sway you get in the building. And that's something called the amplified response spectra. Um, the higher up you go, the more the building wiggles. Well, on the on plants that are this Mark I boiling water reactor design, they've got this enormous weight, the nuclear reactor, and the other enormous weight, the spent fuel pool, way up high in the building. So these Mark I reactors actually pose uh, more of a seismic risk. They're harder to build uh, than, than other designs where the weight is lower. So, Arnie, are power plants on the West Coast designed any differently than the power plants on the East Coast because of different seismic circumstances? Well, the nuclear reactors themselves are essentially identical. But the, the more serious the earthquake, the more serious the bracing that goes around the nuclear reactor, uh, like shock absorbers on a car. But the, the, the question is not are they built stronger on the West Coast, but have they anticipated the worst earthquake imaginable as opposed to the worst earthquake that happened in the last hundred years? Uh, I, I think what Les said is really important, that you have to go back in history long enough so that you get a proper risk assessment. I, I really, as, an, as a design engineer, I, I don't care what happened in the last hundred years. I care about what happened in the last 10,000 years because I'm building against a, a low probability but high consequence event. Correct. And I think in addition to what you said about the resonance frequency with regard to the height of the building, when an earthquake occurs, it releases different types of seismic waves of different types of vibrations, Some, and they have different periods, different vibrational frequencies. Some affect low-rise buildings more. Some affect high-rise buildings more. It also depends upon the distance as to what if taller or shorter buildings are affected. As structures age, they become weaker. I think about my automobile, my car. That the older it gets, the more work I need to put into it, and the less likely I am to run over a bump in the road and feel it will be okay when I come off the other side. 
So as, the, as, our, as our nuclear power plants age, the effects of the same magnetic event might be a little more damaging. You know, we see that at the, at the Seabrook plant where the concrete is degrading very rapidly because there's salt in the, uh, in the underlying soil that the plant is built upon. So that the margin that it used to have 20 years ago when it was built is dramatically reduced now. So we, we wind up eating into design margin as a plant gets older. Any plant can be made to withstand any earthquake, but it boils down to money. And if you believe um, a seven is possible on the East Coast, you're going to build a plant much stronger than the East Coast plants are presently built to withstand. You know, the, the plant in uh, Virginia that was right next to the earthquake was built for a 6, and it had a 5.8. And, of course, it survived because that's what the engineers designed it for. But the real issue is, is the 6 the worst that can be expected on the East Coast? And should we really have designed the plant for a much more rigorous standard? And that's where, in my mind, uh, the East Coast plants are in jeopardy. They're built for these Richter 6s that we know can happen now with, with Virginia. And uh, if a Richter 6 can happen in 20 or 30 years of a nuclear plant's life, then a Richter 6.5 might happen over the duration all these plants are designed to, uh, to operate. So, Les, have we ever seen anything 7 or greater on the eastern seaboard? In the eastern part of the United States, the, there's a high, really high risk area that has the potential for lots of ground motion in the New Madrid, Charleston area. Uh, back in 1811, the late December of 1811, there was a 7.7 .7 event, followed a few weeks later by a 7.5, and a few weeks later by a, another 7.7. .7. So, these events in the New Madrid seismic zone are common. Indeed, they occur every few hundred years. Uh, the last significant event in that area was May of last year, May of 2011, I think it was. There was a 7.7 .7 earthquake again. There are a large network of faults there from a rift that formed 500 million years ago. If we look at the location of the current nuclear power plants, both the commercial reactors and the research reactors, there aren't any that are on the New Madrid seismic zone. You could see they almost make a circle around it because we do recognize that is an area of high risk. But what we don't do is we don't go back far enough in the geological record and take the long view of what might happen. If you think about a business plan, when businesses make a plan for their future, they plan maybe five years out, ten years at the most. Geologically, it's meaningless. We've got to take a much longer view and look at worst-case scenarios because, indeed, they will occur, just the probability is low. You know, I think that's important, is that people think 30 years is a long time, or, or the 40-year life of a plant. So if a plant is designed for 40 years and we look at the worse than a hundred year flood, for instance, or the worse than a hundred year earthquake, we come up with one number. But when you look at the, 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 the longer span, uh, the once in 10,000 year flood or the once in 10,000 year earthquake, suddenly that changes the picture. And we're not, uh, as, a, as a society, we really have a very hard time grasping that low probability events do happen. It's not, it's not zero. And, and Fukushima Daiichi should have taught us that. I mean, the magnitude of the quake and the magnitude of the tsunami, um, both were not a, a once in 10 year, once in 50 year phenomena, but it happened. So and Arnie, even if we're talking about a once in a, a thousand year event, now for one location, for one power plant, that still might not seem like a very high risk. But when you multiply that out by all of the power plants and all of the different locations, does that change things? Yes, it absolutely does. You know, there's 440 nuclear plants in the, in the world right now. And um, if you believe in the, what the nuclear renaissance uh, suggests, there could be two or 3,000 in, um, in 10 or 20 years. So 
the probability of an event hasn't changed, but the number of targets that the event could hit has increased dramatically. So the probability of a plant somewhere having an earthquake that uh, that disables it, we call that, that that damages the nuclear core, goes up significantly. As a matter of fact, the, the worst plant in the country as far as what we call core damage frequency from an earthquake is, uh, is just 26 miles north of New York City. It's the Indian Point plants. After the plants were built, they discovered a fault that's a mile or two north of the plant. And if that fault were to create a seismic event, the nuclear core would be damaged. Uh, are you talking about the Indian Point 3 plant, Arnie? Yes. The, they, actually, it's Indian Point 2 and 3 are on the same site. Right. From the new seismic analyses that were conducted, we've now increased the possibility of risk from the area. It increased by 72%. So now it looks like there's a 1 in 10,000 chance of that plant being a problem. And 10,000, for some reason, 1 in 10,000, those odds seem to be the action stage for the NRC, and I don't know why that is. So it's right there on the border as to what that, that plant has the greatest risk in the country. But when we, you know, when we talk about risk, it all has to do with uh, probabilities and statistics. We use the same idea when we think about flooding. We, for example, when you look at probability statistics, although the 100 year flood doesn't mean that you can have one flood every 100 years. It says there's a small percentage, a point of 1% chance of that flood occurring in any given year. And when you look at probability statistics, the 100 year flood, there's a, you know, we have an 18% chance of two 100 year floods occurring within that time period. So statistics can be funny how we look at them, but just because the numbers seem small doesn't mean that we're safe. So when we're talking about a 1 in 10,000 chance, what time period are we talking about? We're saying that some event may occur, and the chance is 1 out of 10,000. Is that per year? Is that per decade? When, do, when does the clock reset? Yeah, it's a 1 in 10,000 chance every year. And these plants, of course, run for 60 years. So the, the probability of the event occurring sometime during the 60 years is a lot higher than, uh, than one in 10,000. The new chairperson for the NRC, Allison McFarlane, a geologist, realizes that the industry's evaluation of earthquake vulnerability is inadequate. So I think that the NRC is waking up to this problem, but I would be a very, it's going to be an interesting argument as to what we do about it. So let's go to Arnie. Arnie, what is your number one criticism of the NRC and their planning for earthquakes? You know, it basically boils down to the, the, the secret is in the assumptions. And I've said that before in a number of matters. What do they assume is the worst earthquake that can happen? You know, if we look at the Virginia earthquake, for instance, the plant was built for a 6, and it was stood a 5.8. And everybody's happy about that. You know, as an engineer, it, was, it, it survived what it was designed to survive. That proves nothing. But the bigger question is, if it had a 5.8, that tells me that there's a chance it could have a 6.5 in, in, in its lifetime. Uh, low probability, high consequence. So I don't think the NRC is looking at these low probability, high consequence events whether it be tsunami risks or earthquake risk or, or storm surges from, uh, uh, from severe Atlantic uh, uh, hurricanes. Their, their blinders are on. As humans, we, we have a hard time thinking about what's the worst thing that can happen beyond about a 10-year horizon. Uh, and the NRC is in that trap as well. So we've been receiving a lot of emails about uh, fracking or hydrofracking, and questions about whether or not that could be connected to earthquakes. If fracking can cause earthquakes, which I don't know, do we have to be careful about doing it around nuclear power plants less? Fracking, also known as hydraulic fracturing, does cause earthquakes. It's used by industry to increase the porosity and permeability of tight formations so we can extract the resources. 
it's been used also to dispose of toxic liquid waste that we bury, that we drill deep into the earth, and we pump the fluid down there to get rid of it, we know that also causes earthquakes. It's been a recent paper published in the journal Geology just last month looked at um, an earth, a link between wastewater injection and earthquakes. Indeed, it produced a 5.7 earthquake from wastewater injection. So hydrofracking does cause seismic events. The issue with drilling is we can use directional drilling. So we might go down several hundred meters and then go laterally for several kilometers. And therefore, just because the wellhead is at some distance from the, in this case, we're concerned about nuclear power plants, it could be that the earthquakes could occur closer to the power plant depending on where the liquids are. These liquids are not just water that we're putting down there, but there are a number of chemicals and, and also sand is added to keep these fractions, fractures open. So certainly, yeah, we, fracking causes earthquakes. We have to be aware, we are aware of that. We've known this for many years. Well, we've got the history on that recently is in uh, Ohio. It's had a whole series of fracking-induced earthquakes in the Richter 3 to Richter 4 range. But there was one in Nebraska at 5.7. So 5.7 is awfully similar to that 5.8 in, in Virginia. That one, that one, Arnie, was not fracking in the sense of extraction of fuels, which is why fracking is so common now in this country. That was a wastewater injection well that produced a 5.7 out there. It's a little bit different. It's the same idea in the sense that the one in Oklahoma is a 5.7 is wastewater injection. I guess the only difference is the purpose of pumping fluids into the ground. Are we pumping the fluids in the ground because they're too toxic to have near the surface? Are we pumping fluids in the ground to fracture the rock in order to extract some resources? So in either case, high pressure injection of fluids and chemicals will cause earthquakes. So we've been talking about earthquake risk around nuclear plants and how to protect the reactor and the building and whatnot. But what about earthquake risk around spent fuel storage? How do we store the old fuel? You know, we're talking about a nuclear power plant which may run from 40 to 60 years, but of course the spent fuel will need to be stored and protected for much longer. What is the earthquake risk when it comes to storing spent fuel? The fact that the spent fuel will be in a given area for long periods of time, tens of thousands of years, makes it more likely that a seismic event will occur in that area. We can't build a building that lasts reliably for 100 years, let alone tens of thousands of years. So the issue of the storage of nuclear waste is an ongoing problem that nowhere in the world have we solved. You know, that's where Dr. McFarland's expertise really comes in with the NRC. You know, she's been pretty clear that the choice of Yucca Mountain from a seismic standpoint was a really bad choice, and you know, hopefully, you know, Dr. McFarland will push the uh, the agency to consider more stable areas. You know, the, that's our problem, the United States waste. But you know, here's Japan with 50 plants, half the number the United States has, in the most seismically active piece of real estate on the planet. And the Japanese seem to think they can develop a waste disposal site. Yet they haven't even begun the uh, the process yet. It concerns me that they continue to generate enormous amount of waste, and they haven't a found a site, and b recognized that maybe I'll have to ship it to Mongolia or something like that. Because on the island of Japan, there's essentially no piece of real estate that's not seismically active. The chairwoman, uh, Dr. McFarland of the NRC believe, she's on record saying that she believes that a permanent repository can be set up eventually. I'm not so sure about that. Um, I know that Finland's working on a project, but the issue of nuclear waste storage and safety, we could talk about this for several hours. Well, I'm sure we'll have you back on the show in the near future to do that. Right. Okay, well, you say there's no solution to the waste, but there is a solution to the waste, and the solution to the waste is to just leave it exactly where it is and to have somebody look at it for, for a million years, you know. 
So, so they just have to have all these zombies who are there at the moment, sitting there doing nothing, who are going to just have to sit there, and their children are going to sit there, and their children's children and so on, looking at the waste and making sure that it doesn't leak out of the tanks. And if it starts to look like it's going to leak out of the tanks, they build another tank around that tank, and then they build another tank around the tank that they built around that tank, and so on, you know, to infinity. And that is a solution to the waste, because then the waste will just stay where it is now, and it won't get any worse. And if they make more waste, they'll have to put it inside that tank and leave it there. And as far as contaminated land is concerned, and places like Sellafield and all that, they'll just have to put a fence around it and say, this is contaminated land, do not enter. And so that's the best we can do. I mean, it doesn't help to put it down a hole in the ground. I mean, you may as well put it somewhere where you can keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't escape. So that's the solution. And why not put a hole in the ground? Ah, well, because then if something goes wrong, you can't do anything about it. That's the point. And what could be, could go wrong there? Oh, God, well, loads of things could go wrong. I mean, the main thing that would go wrong is that it go, it's, it's a hole in, in the ground is not a secured depository, you know? I mean, you put it into a hole in the ground, and then there's a crack in the hole in the ground, or maybe there's a, an earthquake, or, or maybe there's a fault that you didn't know about, or maybe there's some water movement that, that changes over a period of time. And we're talking geological timescales, so, you know, just about everywhere where they've suggested putting it in a hole in the ground has had a geological um, fault occurring, you know, uh, in, in the last thousand years. Never mind about, you know, the next million years or whatever it is it has for the half-life of these uraniums and plutoniums. So you can't, you can't actually guarantee that if you put it in a hole in the ground, something won't go wrong. And you can't pull it out of the hole in the ground, that's the point. I mean, that the, the Forschmark idea is not one in which they put it down in a hole in the ground and then they can take it out if something goes wrong. They can't. They just pop it down and pop the next one down and pop the next one down and so on and send it all down there and then they seal it all up. But if something goes wrong, then they can't do anything. Whereas if it's where it is at the moment, at Sellafield or wherever it is, above ground or in some kind of big hangar or big kind of area where they kind of look at it, then they can look at it. And if something goes wrong, they've got all their detectors and their Geiger counters and whatnot, then they can just repackage it and put something around it. But they have to sit there? Yeah, they have to sit there forever, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Well, it serves them right, isn't it? They shouldn't have made it in the first place. And I've no doubt they'll pay them a lot of money for sitting there. <laughs> so, yeah, they can sit there. And, I mean, maybe they should have special uniforms, like, you know, guard of the nuclear waste, and they could have, like, special kind of green uniforms with special badges, like Superman or something, you know? That'd make them feel good. <laughs> I've always thought it quite good to have special uniforms. In all the science fiction stories, they did special uniforms, you know. So you could say, what's your daddy do? Oh, he's a guard of the nuclear waste. Oh, no. <laughs> what a useful job, George. Yes, it is, isn't it? 